So thanks for coming everyone. Today I'd like to tell you a little bit about some of the summer field work we did in Saskatchewan. Um, a little bit of a remembrance of the summer past here in the, the little bit of a bleak midwinter. Um, this was work that we did around southern Saskatchewan, um, partly in uh, cooperation with McGill University. So the first question is, where do paleontologists go in Saskatchewan to look for fossils? Well, some people are interested to find out that not all fossils in Saskatchewan are the same age. In fact, Saskatchewan has about 80 million years worth of fossils that are found in different places. So, in order to understand exactly why this is, we have to look a little bit more at the geologic record so we can understand the history of Saskatchewan. So this is what Saskatchewan looked like about 72 million years ago. Um, there was as well, all of North America. You can see that there was this seaway that was coming in to Saskatchewan, splitting North America in half. And at this time, when this seaway was coming in, we had some rocks deposited. So you can find these age rocks in places like Saskatchewan Landing Provincial Park and Unity. So if we fast forward in time to about 70 million years ago, that Western Interior Sea has now connected, and it's now a seaway that stretches from the Arctic Circle to the Gulf of Mexico, completely splitting North America in half. So North America is now split into two. On the western end, there is a microcontinent called Laramidia. And on the eastern end, that continent is called Appalachia. And as I mentioned in between, that western interior, interior seaway is cutting it in half. This was a warm, shallow sea that hosted a whole variety of life. You can see that it's completely covering Saskatchewan. And the rocks that are laid down at this time, you can find in places like the West Walk of Grasslands National Park, places like Herschel, which I'll talk about, and also around this area as well, East End. These are marine rocks that were deposited at this time. So now if we fast forward to about 66 million years ago, that seaway begins to recede again. Um, and as it recedes, we have rocks deposited. So about 66 million years ago, right at the very end of the dinosaurs, this was the time of Scotty the T-Rex, uh, Saskatchewan was actually beachfront property. It was right on the edge of this western interior seaway. And we have localities like the East Block of Grasslands National Park, as well as the Frenchman River Valley, which is where Scotty was found, and the areas around Highway 37 south of Shawnee. These are all rocks that are about 66 million years ago, deposited on the edge of this receding Western Interior Seaway. So if we take a look at what those rocks actually look like, um, these are rocks from Chamber Coulee, close to where Scotty was found. You can see that there is a beautiful succession of rocks that goes from being light colored to dark colored and back into light colored. This is a result of um, the seaway coming in and out and swampy conditions prevailing over drier conditions and they all have a different signature in the rocks. So this is what we call a stratigraphic column. This is what geologists use to map what rocks look like in the ground. So basically, if you were to take a piece of rock or a piece of land, cut it in, in half, this is what the cross section would look like. And so I mentioned that there was a few different ages of rocks in Saskatchewan. So I'll just point a few out. For reference, I've also put the rocks in Alberta, so you can see where all the dinosaurs in Alberta come from, compared to where the dinosaurs in Saskatchewan come from. So in Saskatchewan, a big chunk of our rocks come from what's called the Bear Claw Formation. Uh, the Bear Claw Formation was laid down at a time when Saskatchewan was covered with that shallow sea. So this is what Bear Claw typ Formation typically looks like. This is the West Block of Grasslands National Park. Um, you can see it's all um, shale, so dark colored or black, um, dark colored brown or, or black shale, um, and very slumpy. So these hills are low hills, they're rolling hills, and they're pretty slumpy. So this is the Bear Claw Formation. If we go a little older than the Bear Claw Formation, we get into a different formation called the Dinosaur Park Formation. So if anyone has been to Dinosaur Provincial Park in Alberta, this is that age rock. So those rocks are actually older than the seaway. So these are the rocks we find in places like, as I mentioned, Dinosaur Provincial Park. We also find them in here in Saskatchewan in a couple places, so we'll talk about that. Um, but they're characterized by sort of badland environments with these very steep um, sandstone cliffs. Um, there's mudstone in there too, but the most uh, Obvious features of sandstone cliffs. This is also the kind of environments that hoodoos form in. 
And we also have a formation that's kind of unique to Saskatchewan. It's called the Frenchman Formation, named after the Frenchman River. Um, and that is the formation that we find things like T-Rexes in. Um, so in Saskatchewan, uh, this is kind of what that formation looks like. This is the East Block of Grasslands National Park. Uh, you can see it's also got some of those sandstone cliffs, but the rocks are a little bit softer and they erode a little bit more easily. So they're not quite as striking as the Dinosaur Park Formation, but we still find a lot of fossils in the Frenchman Formation. So just to go back to this question, where, does Saskatchewan, where do paleontologists go in Saskatchewan to find dinosaurs? Well, this summer we went to a couple of different places. So you can see East End Mark there. Um, so one of the places we looked at was Highway 37, south of Shawnee. We went to the East Block of Grasslands National Park. We did some excavation up at Sask Landing Provincial Park on Lake Diefenbaker. And we also went north to a place called Herschel. So I'll talk a little bit about all of these four different places. Um, so we spent four months in the field from June to September. We looked at those four localities. Uh, we had two museum collaborations, one with the U of S and one with uh, McGill University. We covered about 12 million years of geologic time in these four formations. And we collected over a thousand fossils, including at least seven kinds of dinosaurs and at least three kinds of marine reptiles, as well as a whole lot of other kinds of fossils. So this summer, uh, we always rely very heavily on students and volunteers for our field crews. Um, so this year we had three exceptional students from uh, uh, McGill University and the University of Regina. Um, they called themselves the Paleontologics, which I thought was kind of cute. Uh, so one of them was Isabel Fenley, geology student at McGill University. Um, Sarah Popov, also from McGill, um, an environment student and Dakota Bast, who was our Young Canada work student um, from Geology at the University of Regina. Um, as well as our little canine friend, uh, this is Aster, my dog, who was helping us here dig up the KT boundary in uh, grasslands. So she's a little bit of a prodigy in terms of paleontology dog. So the, one of the first places we went to this summer um, was Herschel, Saskatchewan. So Herschel is about a half hour drive from Rosetown. Um, that's about an hour from Saskatoon. Uh, this is where we were in July. So Herschel itself is more or less a ghost town. There's still about 30 people living there, um, primarily because there's a lot of uh, Aboriginal Native American artifacts in this area, and they have an interpretive center. Um, so a lot of people who are still there are involved with the interpretive center. Um, but you can see Herschel is uh, it's a beautiful little town in a beautiful valley. Um, the site that we were on was actually it was, uh, on private land that we had permission to be on, and they raised horses, so we frequently had some uh, horse companions out there. Um, and it was just a beautiful place to be. We had beautiful weather the whole time we were there. Um, it was very quiet, very peaceful, nice place to work. Um, so as you can see on your uh, left there, this is what Herschel looked like when we went out there in June just to do a site check. Um, and you can see there's that little uh, cove that's dug into the rocks. That's where an old excavation site was. So this site was originally um, collected in 2004, and they collected about 3,000 um, specimens from there. So what we wanted to do this summer was to go back to that quarry on the, again on the top left, um, and to remove that part of the hill. So you can see in the picture on the right, um, Sorry, that's on your left. In July 2004, this is all of the, the rock that we moved from that, that one part of the hill because we wanted to get back down to that bow bed layer to find more rocks. Um, so again, this is our field crew on your bottom right there. This is uh, Dakota, Sarah, um, and Isabel and I along with a young volunteer. This is Derek. Um, and this is Derek and his dad helping us uh, do some excavation. Um, we also had some help from a uh, a, a summer camp that came from Saskatoon. So there's a whole bunch, there's about 12 or 14 boys, sort of around 10 to 12. Um, and they were super, super enthusiastic to help us dig, so they helped us move part of that hill. Um, so it was very much a, a group effort. Um, a lot of rock moving involved in this one, but we did actually get down to that bone layer and we were finding some really exciting things. Um, so this is an example of some of the things that we found. 
Um, the two fossils on the bottom there, these belong to a, it's called a polycotylid plesiosaur. This is a short-necked plesiosaur, so one of the ones that has the four flippers. These are all marine reptiles. This is a marine bone bed, I should say, so deposited at the time when Saskatchewan is covered with a seaway. So fossils on the bottom there, these are uh, polycotylid limb bones, so they come from, uh, they're what we call propodial, so they come from somewhere in the body, between the body and the flipper, so like humerus, femurs, things like that. Um, you can see they're in pretty good shape. Um, on the top there, um, you can see that this is actually a piece of wood. So this is one of the interesting things about this site, is that not only does it contain fossils of marine animals, it also contains wood and also pieces of amber. So this tells us that there was actually stuff from the land that was being washed into the sea and also deposited at the same time. Um, on the far, your far left, on that's your far right here, this was a really exciting find that hadn't been seen before, so they didn't notice this in 2004 when it was first collected. This is a trace fossil. So this fossil was made when a little invertebrate, so um, something like a, a worm or a crab, was burrowing the soil, or burrowing in the sand, and, and as it burrowed into the sand, this burrow got filled up with mud. And that mud actually fossilized, and so this is what we have as a perfect little worm burrow preserved here. These, uh, the, bur things like burrows are what we call trace fossils. Trace fossils are very, very important as paleoenvironmental indicators. So this tells us more about the kind of environment that these fossils were deposited in. So as I mentioned, Herschel was actually collected in 2004, was the first collection. Um, and this is our uh, curator of paleontology, Tim DeCarrick, with Dakota. And all of these fossils that you see laid out on the table, these were all collected in 2004. Um, so you can see most of them belong to the polycotylid plesiosaur. Um, there's also fossils from mosasaurus, which is a different kind of marine reptile. Um, some of the long neck plesiosaurs, elasmosaurus, these are the ones with long necks. Um, we also have tons of shark teeth um, and lots of other different kinds of fish. So you can see that this has been a hugely, hugely productive site. So it's a kind of an exciting, exciting site to work in. And again, this summer we found even more there. So the kind of creatures that we find in Herschel, uh, this is just sort of a, uh, an example of some of the most common fossils we find. This guy on the uh, your top left there, that's Dolly Corincops. This is the short neck plesiosaur, the polygotyla that I was talking about. Um, this is a, what on the top, on your top left there, that's a mosasaur, um, another kind of marine reptile. Below it is the elasmosaur, the long neck plesiosaur. We also find these in Herschel as well. Um, on your bottom, the middle left there, this is a fish called Enconus. It looks a little bit like a vampire because it's got these huge teeth that stick out the front. So we find Enconus. And we also find lots and lots and lots of sharks. So there's lots of sharks around at this time as well. Um, sharks were probably scavengers as well as hunters at this time. So they were probably eating everything that they could find as well as scavenging on those carcasses that um, fell to the bottom of the seafloor. One of the interesting things about Herschel was we were there when there was so many mosquitoes. The mosquitoes were terrible when we were there. Um, we actually all ended up buying bug gear. So you can see uh, on your top right there, that's Isabel modeling some of the bug gear that we bought. Um, and the picture on the right there, that's a mosquito photo bomb. So that was a beautiful sunset I was trying to take a picture of and there was a mosquito that flew straight into it. Um, so the mosquitoes were pretty bad, but uh, they didn't take away from our wonderful experience at Herschel. The next thing I want to talk about is Sass Landing on Sass Landing Provincial Park on Lake Beef and Baker. This is work that we did in August in collaboration with the McGill University Paleontology Field School. So this guy here is Hans Larsen. Uh, he runs the vertebrate paleontology field course. Um, and everyone that you see in that picture, these are McGill students um, who come out for the summer to do some digging, to learn about dinosaurs, um, and also to, just to learn about uh, the science of paleontology. So they were out here for two weeks, and Sass Landing was their primary place that they were based. Um, if you haven't been to Sass Landing, it is an absolutely beautiful park. Um, you can see here just some of the amazing sunsets that we saw almost every day. Um, 
On your bottom right there, this is a picture of us hiking out to the site. Um, so it was about an hour's hike out to the site. You can imagine if you're carrying your, your backpack and all of your collecting gear, um, this is a little bit of a long hike. It's not, it's not flat either, it's sort of rolling, rolling prairies. So this is what the site at SAS Landing looks like. Now SAS Landing comes from the age of the rock at SAS Landing is the same as the age of the rock and in Dinosaur Provincial Park. So these rocks were laid down actually before the sea came in and covered Saskatchewan. Um, so these rocks are older than what we find at Herschel. Um, and it's a, just an amazing site. Uh, it's a dinosaur bone bed. So it's a bone bed that has lots of different kinds of dinosaurs as well as lots of other different kinds of vertebrates in it. Um, we actually did have a boat for this site, so you can see on the bottom right, um, there's our, it's actually McGill's boat um, that's pulled up on the shore there, and you can see there's some curious cows that came by every day to take a look at what we were doing. Uh, we used the boat to transport uh, field jackets, some of our gear, a lot of the plaster that we used to wrap the fossils in is very heavy, so we took it all out on the boat. Um, and you can see here, this is just uh, some of the students in Hans working in the bone bed. So it's just an amazing place to work. Um, this is another site that involved a lot of digging. Um, so you can see here, this is a, a pit that I actually dug. There's a pickaxe and a shovel there for scale. Um, so the idea was to get down to where the bone layer was. So um, the girl in the picture here, her name is Holly. So where her feet are, um, is actually where the bones are found. So we have to get to that rock, remove all the rock on top of that bone layer. Um, so lots of hard work in that heat, um, but of course sometimes we do like to take breaks as well. Um, so this is what some of the fossils at Sasquatch look like. Um, the top right there, this is a tooth from a Tyrannosaurid. Um, not Tyrannosaurus, Tyrannosaurus had Evolved yet. This is a, an older Tyrannosaurus that's related to T Rex. Um, so, this was just a tooth that we found just on the ground as soon as we, uh, we got there, pretty much. Um, below it, this is um, part of a uh, Ceratopsian dinosaur or horn dinosaur, probably part of the frill. Um, you can see on the left there, this is what the bone bed looks like with some of the bones um, actually exposed but not jacketed yet. And on the bottom, these are all field jackets of everything that we. Uh, collected and then took out of the site. So these fossils are now at McGill University. They're being prepared um, so that we can actually take a look, a better look at what actually we're finding at this boat, at this particular site. Um, so when, when we were at SAS Landing, we had some company. Um, Dr. Ryan Keller, who is the curator of invertebrate paleo at the RSM, um, came out for a day to take a look at specifically the amber that we also find at the SAS Landing site. Um, so he came out, and also the uh, our current tour assistant, Wes Long, um, also came out with him, and uh, they got to take the boat out, so they were lucky. <laughs> so some of the creatures that we find at Sask Landing, uh, we find Ceratopsian, so horned dinosaurs, but not Triceratops, so Triceratops hadn't actually evolved yet. This particular animal is something called a Chasmosaurus, and that's the kind of Ceratops we get at Sask Landing. As I mentioned, we get <coughs> Tyrannosaurids, but not Tyrannosaurus. This particular animal is called a Displetosaur, which looks like a Tyrannosaur, but is actually a little bit smaller. Uh, we find Hadrosaurs, or duck-billed dinosaurs, uh, but we don't find Anbotosaurus, which is the one that we find in the Frenchman Valley. Uh, we find other ones, um, animals like Corythosaur and Landosaur, which are uh, pictured here. We also find a suite of birds. So, specifically diving birds called Hesperonis. Uh, this summer we actually found a bird pelvis preserved in the ground in Sasmani. So that was pretty exciting. Uh, but also lots of crocodiles we get there, as well as these animals called Chancesaurs, which are crocodile-like, but not actually related to crocodiles. But they're also very common in Sasmani. Um, so when we were out, well, most of the time when we were out in the field, we're actually camping. Um, so you can see on the bottom right there, this is our tent city um, at, at SAS Landing. Uh, we had a big cook tent that we erected and we put all our food in it. It's where we did most of our cooking. Um, and when we're out there, we have no showers and so we rely a lot on the lake to help us keep clean and clean our clothes and all that kind of stuff. But uh, we eat really well, generally. Um, at SAS Landing, for the most part, we had beautiful weather. Um, but we did have one 
amazing storm that ripped through there. And uh, this is just a picture of what our boat bed looked like after that storm. Um, you see there's puddles everywhere. And uh, I think we called this the recreation of the Western Interior Seaway. Um, fortunately, uh, we had gotten most of the fossils out by the time the storm hit. Uh, the ones that we didn't were okay to get out a little bit later. But yeah, for the most part, we had good weather in August. The other site we were at this summer was Grasslands National Park. Um, this is the, particularly the east block of Grasslands National Park. This is one of my favorite places in the world. It is just gorgeous. It's uh, natural grasslands. Um, and just, you can, there's places you can go where you can't see anything except grasslands and sky. Um, so just an incredible place to work. Um, on the bottom right there, this is just a picture of what some of the badlands in the east block look like. Um, Lots, lots of mudstone there, so the rocks are pretty soft, but we do find lots and lots of fossils there. Um, and this is just Isabel looking out over um, a part that we call the Valley of the Thousand Devils, which is where we find a lot of the fossils. So grasslands, um, it does have some articulated dinosaurs, um, but mostly what it is well known for is the microvertebrate fossils. So these are small, well-sorted fossils, things like fish scales, fish vertebra, crocodile, um, dermal scoots, bird bones, like really little fossils that can fit in the palm of your hand, as illustrated here. Um, microvertebrate fossils are really uh, important for the study of paleobiodiversity, because if you find a dinosaur, it's really exciting, uh, but all it tells you is that that dinosaur was living there. Whereas microvertebrate fossils, if you just pick up a handful, you can already tell, for example, in this handful, there are nine species there. So they're really important for studying paleobiodiversity. Um, on the left, uh, yeah, on the, I guess it's your right here, um, this is the site we were working at primarily. This is what we call the Gar Scale Microsite. Uh, it's a site we've been working on for three years now. Uh, very, very exciting site. It has a articulated dinosaur, I'm sorry, disarticulated dinosaur in the bottom layer. Um, so you can see there, this is Sarah in the yellow jacket. And she's excavating the humerus from this dinosaur. It's a ductile dinosaur called a Muntosaurus. On top of that skeleton, there's a vertebrate microsite where we find fossils like the ones I'm holding in my hand there. And on top of that, there is a fossil plant layer. So all wrapped into one, we have macrofossils, we have microfossils, and we have plant fossils. So this is a very, very exciting site. It's also really close to the extinction layer of the dinosaurs. So it's important for understanding what's going on um, with the biodiversity immediately prior to that end Cretaceous mass extinction. So these are the kind of creatures that we find in the grassland, uh, grassland site. We do get Tyrannosaurus rex this time, so I should mention that grasslands um, is not the same age as sass mining. Grassland, the rocks in, in grasslands are the Frenchman formation, so that, those are the rocks that were laid down after the sea had receded, so the beachfront property kind of era. Um, so by this time we do get Tyrannosaurus rex, they had appeared on the scene at this time. Um, we have one type of hadrosaur, ductile dinosaur, this is Edmontosaurus, the most common kind we find. We get Triceratops, that's the only horned dinosaur that we get, um, as far as we know. Um, and we still get lots of Chapsosaurus, lots of crocodiles, and lots and lots and lots of turtles. Um, almost hands down, turtles are the most common thing that we find in the French Formation in grasslands. So while we were there, um, Grasslands hosted what they called the Badlands Blast and Fossil Festival. Uh, this was great for us. Um, you can see on your bottom left there, they had brought a whole bunch of um, visitors out to the site uh, to help us with the excavation, to help us with the collection. So there's one day we had about 20 people out at the site, which was awesome. Um, on the top left there, this is a volunteer. Her name is Jasmine, and she's actually helping us jacket one of the fossils that we found. Um, in the center here, this is one of the park staff, and he's dressed up as George Mercer Dawson. Um, George Mercer Dawson is arguably one of Canada's most famous geologists. Um, he was, in 1879, 1878, he was uh, going through Saskatchewan. He was actually mapping the 49th parallel between Canada and the United States. And as he was going through the area, which is now grasslands, he came across the first dinosaur ever found in Western Canada. Um, and he collected it and he sent it to the Canadian Museum of Nature, where it still is today. Um, 
but he, not, he was not only an amazing geologist, but he also uh, found the first dinosaur in Western Canada. So that's why we're celebrating George Mercer Dawson. Um, they had a cake for us, which was pretty awesome, a bad one's last cake, um, as well as things like wagon rides. So it was a lot of fun. Um, everyone had a really good time. The girl students loved it. Um, the visitors who came for it loved it. So it was a really good experience. The other slide I want to talk about briefly is Highway 37. So probably some of you have actually driven on this highway, south of Shonovan. Um, so at one point it goes down into the Frenchman River Valley, and that's where the site that we're interested in is. And the reason this site is really, really cool is because it has what's called the KT Boundary, which is pictured on the bottom left there. Um, this is what Isabel's project, her research this summer, was basically on the KT Boundary. Um, so what is the KT Boundary? Well, it is a layer of white clay in the rock. Below it is the Frenchman Formation. Above it is the Raven's Crag Formation, which is Paleocene. Um, so basically, dinosaurs below it, no dinosaurs above it. And that white line is the KT boundary, and it basically marks the end Cretaceous mass extinction event. That is the extinction of the dinosaurs, and it's clearly marked in the, in the rocks. You can actually put your finger on it and say, this is where the dinosaurs went extinct. So Saskatchewan has probably the finest exposure of KT boundary in Canada, and one of the best known in the world in terrestrial settings. So very, very important rocks here in Saskatchewan. Um, so these were some of the things that we found this summer at the Highway 37 site. Uh, below the boundary, we found some dinosaur bones, so top left there. Um, that is probably a scapula, a shoulder bone from a hadrosaur. Um, we also found a fossilized tree, which was kind of exciting for us. Um, the top left, uh, the top, your top right, uh, that is uh, just the tree we just found it. You can see it's black in color, but just exquisite preservation of the bark. Um, on the bottom right, uh, bottom left there, that is Sarah jacking the tree, so we uncovered this tree and we collected it. Um, and above the boundary, uh, we didn't collect them this summer, but previously collected, they have some beautiful, beautiful leaf fossils. So this is a really exciting site for a number of reasons. So our cast of characters from Highway 37, uh, we have the Edmontosaurus. This summer we also found scar scales, so these are scales from a, a garfish. Um, and then we also found some theropod bones, so bipedal carnivorous dinosaurs, below the boundary. And then above the boundary, um, we found a chancellor vertebra, just one, but it was there. Um, and historically, there's also been chancellor skeletons, entire skeletons collected above the boundary of this site, uh, as well as a jaw from the earliest um, Paleocene mammal known. It's a little guy called Telidus. Um, this was collected in the 80s by uh, the University of Alberta paleontologists. Um, so I mentioned that we also find some amazing plant fossils at this site as well. So this is us with uh, that tree that we found, we nicknamed it Tree Beard. Um, and you can just see how it ended up being about two and a half meters long uh, when we finally excavated it. And you can see on the bottom there just exquisite preservation of the bark, like a beautiful, beautiful specimen. Um, and above the boundaries I mentioned, uh, we get some incredible leaf fossils, just beautiful, beautifully preserved. Um, so this was a very exciting site. So some people ask me, so when you go in and excavate fossils, so what do you do after? Like, what do we do in the winter when we can't go out and excavate fossils? Um, and the answer is, we basically do science. Um, so one of the things we have to do is prepare all the fossils we find. So on the uh, the top left there, these are some volunteers in our lab preparing fossils from Herschel. Um, so on the bottom there, this is what prepared specimens look like. Every specimen has to be given a number and it has to go into our database. And that's how we know what fossils we have. And we can also start doing statistics, uh, biological statistics on the fossils we have to determine things like biodiversity trends. Um, we can also do look at the morphology morphology, or the uh, outward appearance of the fossils we find. Uh, this is uh, Dr. Eric Snively, um, who is doing research on T-Rexes. So this is him with one of Scotty's femur. Um, he's doing some measurements and he wants to, uh, he's going to look at variations in size in T-Rexes. So uh, basically we do, we do do science on the fossil that we collect. 
Um, and what's really exciting here in Saskatchewan is that Saskatchewan is starting to really embrace its paleontological history. Um, and we're starting to get notice. So this was a paper that came out just this last spring on fossil plants from the Frenchman Formation in Saskatchewan. Um, and it got a huge amount of coverage. It was on quirks and quarks. So we're really starting to get notice, which is exciting. So really, the take-home message from all of this is that Saskatchewan paleontology rocks. Um, we may not be as well known as Alberta yet, um, but we certainly have the potential to be. Uh, this picture is uh, the McGill Field School, just outside Pontex, Saskatchewan, uh, which, just outside Pontex, there was a plesiosaur, a long-necked plesiosaur that was collected, and this was a statue that was erected uh, sort of in its honor. Uh, the statue is called Mo. And it's kind of tradition that every time the Gale Field School comes out, we go out and we take a picture with Mo the Plesiosaur. Um, so if you are at all interested in getting involved with the RSM, with any of our fossil collections, both in the field and in the lab, please, please come and volunteer with us. We're always looking for volunteers. Um, absolutely no experience necessary. We can provide you with all the tools and all the training. Um, what we really need is just people to come out um, and to be willing to learn it to help us with this science. So if you are at all interested in coming out um, and volunteering either here in Extend or in Regina, um, please let us know. Um, our emails are on the website. Uh, you can give us a call. Also, numbers on the website. So we are always more than willing to have people come and volunteer with us. Thank you very much.